Hi, everyone. Welcome to Crickets to Cha-Chings. I'm Julie Berninger, and I'm here with Deanna Seymour from The Playhouse. She is a fun, creative Etsy seller, and I know she really understands two things that are super important to me and all of us selling on Etsy. One is seasonal strategy, and the second one is collaboration, which not all Etsy sellers are utilizing that today. So we're going to get into how Deanna grew her business through the network and power of partnering with other people. Deanna, welcome. How's it going? Thanks so much for having me. It's going well over here, and I'm pumped to have you as well. So let's kick it off. Can you start with a quick intro on you? Yeah, sure. I'm Deanna. I'm the founder of The Playhouse, which is a new business building collective um, that utilizes networking and collaborations to get more visibility to grow your creative businesses. So you started out as an Etsy seller. Tell us the history of your shop, when you started it, and what you were selling. Okay. Um, so this was back in 2004. So we're talking two decades ago. Uh, my sister had a baby and I made, well, she had two babies cause she had twins. That was weird. I said that, but, um, I made them each these cute little stuffed monsters and I just got this idea to create custom ones for people, but I wanted them to fill out like a Mad Lib. Like, you know, when you see like a missing sign for like a cat or dog or something, and so it was called Missing Monsters, and people had to fill out these little Mad Libs about how many eyes it had, what colors it was, and where they last saw it. Then I would create the monster and then photograph it somewhere. I live in Richmond, Virginia, somewhere around Richmond that kind of related to where they last saw it. Like, somebody said they last saw theirs at the beach, and so I went in front of, like, a tanning salon and was like, oh, here's your monster. It was at the tanning salon. I found it. And I would, like, literally call them on the phone because it's funny it's making me sound like an old grandma but in two, 2004 <laughs> I was okay I would call them on the phone and be like hey I found your monster and then they would pick it up so it was so funny because I barely had a website I used a MySpace um but and people would like you know at the grocery store too back in the olden times people would like cut the bottom of a flyer and you could like take a thing. So when I first made a website, I made flyers like that and people could rip off my website address. And then I was like fancy and had a Google form for them to fill out online so that I could go beyond Richmond. But at first it was like all on postcards and all in Richmond. Um, and they could pick up their monsters at a local monster shelter. So I teamed up with like a sushi restaurant, a used bookstore, a toy store, and oh a video store like a video rental store is this making me sound like this was like in 1950 <laughs> it was called fan video fan it was like a little independent video store in richmond and they all agreed to be monster shelters so when i would call people i'd say oh hey it's over at you know sticky rice the sushi restaurant and you can go pick it up when you when you're ready um and so that was the beginning of my etsy journey um, and I guess now you're like, wait, well, how did it get on Etsy? Which the thing that was on Etsy was baby monsters. Cause I had all these scraps and I was like, what am I going to do with all these scraps? So I started making just little baby monsters with my scraps and I put those up on Etsy. Um, and I also started going to the thrift store and getting like little kid clothes and I would use my scraps to sew like a monster in the pocket or something like that. Uh, so missing monsters existed on Etsy but it wasn't the custom stuff until later. But then it grew. Now my memory is hazy because it was 20 years ago. But Etsy was definitely part of it. But mostly for baby monsters and stuff like that. Wow. Okay. So first of all, 20 years ago, this blows my mind. Um, <laughs> it's like time goes by so fast, right? So you were part of this OG movement. I think this was after the teeny beanie baby craze and the beanie babies and such, but it feels like a nod to something there. And I, if anyone has not watched the beanie baby documentary, it is very worthwhile. Have you seen it? Uh, -uh no, I haven't. Oh my I'm goodness. Intrigued. As a business owner, you're just watching how this played out. And I'll just mention this because it reminded me of your story. In the beanie baby documentary, they talked about how one woman that worked there in marketing it seemed like she was a more junior employee. She came up with the idea to put the poems on the tags. I don't know if you remember that about the Beanie Babies or if you were part of like the Beanie Baby craze, but I was a 90s kid and Beanie Babies were a huge thing. But the poems were like the whole thing. And, you know, you didn't want to rip the tag off because the tag was precious and, and all that. Um, and now people give them to their kids and their kids rip the tag off and you're like, no, I saved that forever. 
but yeah, it's the Beanie Baby documentary is great. But you with your whole like monster scavenger hunt thing, you kind of remind me of that. But I'm a little confused on how it works. So was the scavenger hunt the parent would actually go on the hunt, or is it like an older kid, or you know who like how who actually got the the hunt and was it like a physical paper or you hadn't delivered it yet right so it was like yeah what were they getting oh okay good questions um so let's just go to the old school one where they i mean i guess it doesn't matter if they filled out the google form or they filled out a piece of paper but when they picked up their monster and i also shipped monsters once i um had the website and they did the google thing so they would get a little letter and a photo, like a printed photo. Again, I'm sorry, everyone. By the way, I'm 43 years old. I sound like I'm 120, but um, <laughs> they would get a printed photograph of their monster wherever it was in Richmond and a little note from me saying, hey, I found it, you know, at the at the tanning salon or wherever I found it at the library, um, along with the plush monster, which was more like a pillow, um, kind of, I guess, too, like sort of like ugly doll kind of a thing, but, you know, like custom um, and so that is what they would either pick up if they were local to me, pick up or pay for shipping to go um, to their house, which also, I mean, if the U.S. Postal Service is listening, I don't know if this was allowed or not, but I would go get those free priority boxes and I would turn them inside out because I thought they looked too much like a mailing box, you know, and you can undo them and like redo them and tape it back together. And I would spray paint on the on the outside like caution like monster inside and stuff. So it was, I think like really, I mean, I, I was also an art teacher, so it was a little experiential and like creative like that. But so I did the scavenger hunt. Like they, they were missing their monster. They told me what it looked like. And then I was kind of like the monster finder. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And I'm also, I'm just like blown away because, and this is why I love working with Etsy sellers because there are just so many really creative people that just find so much joy. Like one day you woke up and said, I'm going to do this. And you just made this elaborate world. And I'm sure the parents ate it up, but I don't know what marketing was probably hard back then. Was it more of like a word of mouth thing where like one parent would do it and then you'd find out from others, they'd hear about it or how did you yeah. spread the marketing then? I mean, I also did a lot of craft shows. So um, I was also in a group called the Richmond Craft Mafia at that time. Um, and so they were like, I don't know if they still are, but there was like craft mafias all over the country, sort of little chapters. And so, I mean, I did craft shows, like I said, I'm in Virginia, but I did some in Philly, down to North Carolina, DC, um, Brooklyn was a big one, um, the Renegade, Renegade Craft Show. Um, and so really just like doing those and sort of spreading the word but yeah it's kind of funny because there was no instagram yet um and yeah just craft shows i guess and i would also sell gift certificates at craft shows which came with a little envelope kind of explaining the process it had the paper for them to fill out so like if a fun aunt or uncle was at the craft show and they were like oh my god this is so cool i'm gonna give it to my niece or nephew then they would like write out the answers and mail it to me like i remember there was like a girl named Chloe. It's like crazy now that I remember her name, but she was like doing bad bedtimes. And so they ordered like a sleepy monster for her. And so it had like eyelids that were like sleepy <laughs> and like her sleepy monster. Like I would call and be like, is Chloe home? This is Deanna from Missing Monsters. Like, is Chloe home? And she'd be like, hello. And I'm like, Chloe, I found your monster. It's like super sleepy. So you have to like do good bedtimes and sleep with it. And it was like, really fun i don't know now i'm like oh my gosh you guys should i start this business again should i quit my I current mean, business <laughs> i'll tell you right now i feel like this could be huge i watched the beanie baby documentary a year ago but just another kind of parallel here is that at the beginning i'm calling the guy ty i forget the name of the founder or whatever <laughs> but he would only sell the beanie babies through independent stores he oh, refused God. big chain stores so and i remember this growing up like we had an aunt that lived in what I felt was a random town in Massachusetts. And we, every time we visited her, we got to go to this tiny store, which is like very small. And that's where we get to the Beanie Babies. And uh, I think that's a genius play. So hearing kind of how you have, you, you enmeshed yourself in the community to grow this whole thing. And, mm -hmm. and also just, you know, I'm going to get into that in a second, but thinking more, this strategy of the kids' toys, but making them more experiential is still a thing. You can think of Elf on the Shelf and yeah. a lot of Etsy sellers. I'm not here to debate the legality of selling Elf on the Shelf trademark stuff or whatever they call it. Elf kits, fine. I think a lot of us know using that term is probably a no-no. That being said, 
it's huge right now. And, you know, people like to help uh, facilitate all of that stuff. You know so, what else I want to yeah. say really quick for marketing this? Because as you're talking, I'm like, what else? How did I get the word out? I want to say that I'm real brave. My husband makes fun of me. He always says it would really make my day. Like I will ask anybody anything. Like I will just ask because I'm just like, what's the worst that can happen? I won radio tickets during the holiday season in Richmond. I love to call in a radio station. I'm actually pretty lucky when it comes to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I won tickets to like the Richmond uh, Nutcracker performance. And when I went to pick up my tickets, I gave them a snowman, Missing Monster, and was like, happy holidays. Thanks. I can't believe I won. And then they called me and they were like, we want to interview you on the air. This is crazy. This Missing Monsters thing is so fun. And I was in Richmond Magazine twice, RVA Magazine, Richmond Parents Magazine. Like, I am not scared to send an email and be like, hey, I'm doing this fun thing. Do you want to know about it? Um, and so now thinking back, I'm like, I also think my, you know, gumption of just being like, hey, I did a cool thing. Do you want to talk about it? Uh got me some press and some stuff like that too so yeah. don't be afraid to just like reach out to people who you think little old me you know like you can like get stuck in a bubble where you're like nobody cares what I'm doing but I was always like hey I'm doing this fun thing because the worst that could happen is they just like don't email you back or don't call you back um but also the coolest thing that could happen is that like the radio calls you and interviews you and your best friend's mom records it on cassette tape at her house <laughs> it's like so old but anyways yeah be not being brave you know what I mean putting yourself out there oh man that applies to so many things and I don't think it means you need to be the most socially adept uh, eloquent person you just gotta force yourself to do what feels uncomfortable because I've noticed people they like to say well I'm an introvert I don't want to do this and it's like okay you don't want to do it that's fine but that is what works so do the uncomfortable things. And the more you do them, the more you kind of get over it. And you're just like, all right. But that, yeah, that's smart. You drop it off at a lo local business. And people love supporting local businesses, local communities. So, okay. So let's talk a little more because I, I think even though, you know, someone listening is gonna say, well, that was 20 years ago. Okay. The <laughs> same is the same playbook has been played over time and time again. Like this could still work. So let's talk about beyond just you dropping off the snowman somehow you got a sushi restaurant to agree to be a monster shelter. And I'm guessing what was in it for them is that they brought more traffic in as people went to pick up their orders. Like, yeah. tell me more about, you know, where you got this idea. Was it literally that you didn't want to ship the things or were you like, oh, this is more convenient or this is more fun? Like, what was the reason you did it? I think it's just, I think I'm cheap, like full disclosure. I would love to save on shipping whenever I can. And, um, like, also, I should talk about how maybe back then I wasn't the best at pricing things. So the first monsters I ever sold were $20 a piece. Um, I think by the end, they were up to 40 which is still, like, pretty darn cheap. I mean, even in 2004 for a fully custom. Like, I remember seeing FAO Schwartz did this thing towards the end of me doing Missing Monsters that was, like, your kid draws a monster and they, like, make it. And it was, like, $100. And I was, like, oh. I'm an idiot. Like, oh gosh, I only charge 40. It's just me over here with my sewing machine. Um, so I think it was like a little bit of both. I was like, oh my gosh, Richmond people won't have to pay for shipping. They could like pick it up somewhere. But of course it was just me in my house. So like, obviously strangers aren't going to come to my house. And um, the other thing is like, I think I don't want to put pressure on people. I think because it was like so different and kind of quirky people like wanted to be involved. And like you said, like, if you're going to go pick up your your um, monster at the sushi place, you're probably going to maybe get sushi for dinner too. Like that, I would want to get sushi for dinner if I'm going to pick up my monster. Um, I also started like um, little street teams in different cities, which is something I had just remembered right now. But essentially, because back then it was like on MySpace, I was like, who wants to help me promote these? And I would send them those kits I was talking about. Or no, I would send them the postcards. And they would just like, it was like guerrilla marketing, you know, they just put them in coffee shops in their town. And I put little uh, numbers on them, which is like the, the like oldest school affiliate program, essentially. <laughs> and then if that postcard got mailed to me, then I knew somebody in like Boston put it in a coffee shop in Boston. I didn't do a ton with that because the whole time too, I was an art teacher. So like, this was also my side hustle, which I think is also ultimately why it didn't become my full-time hustle, there's probably people listening going like, yeah, when it gets really busy, but not busy enough to pay your bills and you still have to go to your day job, you're like, ah, what do 
I do? Um, and I think ultimately that was me just being like, oh, probably because they were only $40. Like, I can't keep doing this and work my real job. Um, yeah. But yeah, I think I'm off track. Sorry, the ADHD. No, we all, I think we all, we all feel that exactly. We feel that in your heart, exactly what you're saying. I mean, it applies to everything, right? Where you have to kind of make a choice, like which one am I going to do? And for whatever reasons you made the choice that you did and other people, most people will also make that choice. Sometimes people, they're like, no, I'm going to go all in. And I'm always like cheering them on. I'm like, you go for it. But it's, it's, it might not be the right time. It's scary, all that stuff. Yeah. Well, and I think too, I going back to what you were saying, like, why did I pick the monster shelters? Having the monster shelters gave me a little bit of uh, like social clout to see like, okay, well, Sticky Rice likes her, Video Fan likes her. So who's this monster girl? She must be cool. All these places that had been around in Richmond and still are around, like established places in Richmond. Okay. They're like into it. Maybe I should be into it. So I think that kind of collaboration can help you also uh I don't really like the word like authority but you know builds your authority and then like when people say any friend of hers is a friend of mine like now all of a sudden I'm a friend with all these cool businesses in Richmond so I must be cool too right wink wink okay so that's an age-old marketing principle all of us who are in the online course creator space we're doing it right like if you look at my Instagram you'll see featured in CNBC Forbes and it just whether or not you're supposed to be doing that it, it gives you somewhat of credibility well the person's like okay this person was fact checked by cnbc so they must be more legit right um which is which is true when you are featured in press they look over all of your records they make sure that you are who you say you are you have to show them screenshots it is and i always feel better when i work with someone that has been featured by the press because i'm like okay this person is featured by the press yeah. similarly you know when you're working with another business they're like oh i love that sushi restaurant like if they like this monsters thing then then also I know it's like big and it's just so smart. I don't see enough people doing that today. So I'm just obsessed with this idea. And I just hope that people listening think, how could I apply this to my business? Yeah. Well, and also I, it's like all coming back to me. This is so fun. This is like fun for me. I'm like, oh my gosh, memory lane. I made them a monster. Like when I approached them to be a monster shelter, part of that was that they would get a monster to display. So there was a sushi monster at the sushi restaurant. There was a thing. So it wasn't just like me being like, hey, I need a place for people to pick up a monster. It was more like, I think your restaurant's cool. I come here for trivia night. Can I make you guys a monster? And can people come pick up their monsters here? So I think it's important too to not feel like, oh, I just like am not valuing my time or I like gave it away for free. Like it's definitely part of like I mean now we pay for ads and stuff like that so like making them a monster is definitely part of I don't know I don't want to say like the wooing process but like you know what's in it for them like you're gonna get this fun monster and if they had heard about me it, it made sense so I think sometimes we I love that like boundaries are a thing and we want to get paid for our time and we don't want to just do stuff for exposure I love all those things and I think those are real messages but also if you're like too tight with it you can sort of come off like, oh, I don't know. Like you have to, you have to approach people. You almost have to like give before you can ask sort of a thing. I think in relationship building and networking, you can't just go to like networking events or, or approach a business to team up with. And it's just like, hey, I need more customers. Can I <laughs> do this thing? Yeah. I want to feed off your authority and like build my authority. Like you have to, it has to be reciprocal. I guess that's what I'm saying. Oh my gosh, I love this. And it reminds me so Cody, my business partner, and I have a client that's a realtor and realtors get this. Realtors are in those local businesses and they're swapping and every, you know, everyone needs a realtor and they're always tagging each other on Instagram and all that stuff. But um, I as part of the course that this realtor was building that I was helping her with, she was talking about how when when you have coffee dates as a realtor, like, for example, a lender really wants to meet a realtor because... Mm -hmm. They want to refer the realtor's clients to their preferred lenders. But after you're an experienced realtor, you already have your lenders like getting another coffee date. It's like, oh my goodness, so I have to, it's more time. You're not going to get anything out of it. So she talks about how um, a lender that blew her mind made a big donation, like a couple hundred dollars. It wasn't like huge, but a big donation to a cause that she had been posting about on social media. And in that case, she's like, oh, like, you know, you just helped me meet my goal for this cause. I'd be more than happy to have coffee with you. And then they end up having coffee. Didn't mean she was going to work with her, but it was like the foot in the door for them to have that conversation, hit it off. And then it resulted in a partnership. So for you, it was giving them free product that they think was cool. 
mm-hmm. and starting that relationship. So thank you for mentioning that because that, that is an important piece. It doesn't have to be free product, but it, it, there has to be something. And people might not want to jump right into like a win-win business transaction without getting into it first with, in yeah. some other me- method. Yeah. And also I will say too, once you get some businesses on board, like it, get, it got even easier. You know, like you can approach the next one and be like, hey, I already have Sticky Rice and Video Fan do you want to do this? Like, I think a bookstore could be cool too. That also like, just like it works, like we were saying on the website works for getting more collaborators or sponsors or like, as you do it, like it's real scary the first time, like you were saying introverts and stuff like that. And it feels scarier. And then it just gets like easier and easier. And you have more like social proof to back up. Like I'm doing this, this thing, you know? Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Okay. So tell us about, um, I guess in your perspective, just right before you decided to kind of move on from it, when you're like, okay, this is a lot of work, all this stuff. Did you ever consider of trying to go the Beanie Baby route or like trying to like, hey, like, you know, if you did this today, for example, we'd have like a Shopify store and you'd be running ads like, hey, Richmond, get your monster. And you know what I mean? Like you'd be, you'd see the ads, it'd be stalking you everywhere. And you're like, oh, I got to get the monster. Yeah. Um, you know, n- then I don't know if you had a, a, a easy path to see what was next like, okay i have an etsy shop how do i scale this to to be the next beanie babies or whatever yeah i think i just was like really this is the art teacher in me probably the art school kid um like i was really attached to the whole thing so probably my way forward would have been for it to be really expensive and keep the experience because i was even like i was selling those kits at craft shows I was like showing pictures of like I wasn't I was just like so committed it's like I'm some character actor like I'm some actor like you know what is that called when they like don't break the role the whole time they're on set like I just was like this is missing monsters this is not just like they're for sale and towards the end I felt pressure from other people to be like you should bring some to craft shows and then like people can adopt them there and I'm like I did it and it just didn't feel the same like it just wasn't as magical as someone like dreaming up a monster and me making it and doing the photo and pretending like I found it um so ultimately it was just I probably needed to increase the price and sell less and I probably could have kept doing it and kept my day job but at 20 or 40 bucks a pop like I did end up hiring someone to help me one holiday season because I just remember having all these like strewn across like Mm -hmm. all these pieces like she was my stuffer (laughs) like stuffer and like sew them closed and we were just like cranking them out. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is my like break from teaching. This is my holiday break, not my like go to my sweatshop now for my holiday break. Uh, yeah. So I think I just needed to raise the price, to be honest, now that I know more about business. But right. I was just like a young punk who was like, $40 feels like a lot, you know, plus and, you I mean, think even that t- it's 50 Right. And even today, I mean, a parent, how much does a parent expect to spend on a toy, right? Yeah. Like it's, it's tough. Yeah. And exper- your experience, experiences are hard to scale and the experience is what made it special. Yeah. So yeah, sure. those are all like still the still question marks today of you left to figure out like, how would I do this? Those are excellent points. I do love you mentioning the seasonal nature of it too, though. And I, mm-hmm. this is kind of random, but um, did you see the woman on the news that was famous for the porch pumpkins in Texas? No. She like runs a zip code. She made a million dollars revenue and her job every year, she decorates people's porches with like pumpkins and stuff uh-huh. and makes it look like super picturesque like a magazine a pinterest yeah. image or whatever um but i just love like i mean th- this is true for all of us in selling any etsy space there is something special about the holiday season depending on what you sell and that's a big time and i just thought it was kind of cool um her business just tacking on to those seasonal trends mm-hmm. and i tried to think well for etsy sellers how can we learn from this Like what? Because she says she makes a million dollars in like 30 days. And then the reporter asked her, oh, do you want to do Christmas? And she's like, no, that's my time with my kids. I can't do Christmas. And I'm like, that's Mm -hmm. such like an Etsy seller response too. Because we like literally don't have the time to do it. And like with everything else going on in our lives, you know, it's just, it's very difficult. Even though we have these grand empire dreams, sometimes it can be challenging uh, to execute them year round. And particularly when all this stuff is happening at the time that we're also doing all this stuff for our our households. But anyways... When thinking about trying to do, take this idea and bring it to Etsy, it reminds me of your monster thing. And I think of like, okay, well, what, you know, you had success 20 years ago with this monster idea. I still think monsters are huge. When I looked in the search data for Halloween, monster kit was like booming two years in a row. And you just 
give people I think it's like a Halloween favor or something but you give people the little things to make their own monsters I can see like cra- craft kits you know I just yeah, bought yeah. my daughter a whole bunch of craft kits make your own stuff she did a, her own sewing thing it was mostly like narwhals and unicorns mm-hmm. but um you know a, a monster variety of that could be really cool and also when I think of trends like the boot have you heard of the boo basket trend I think, but you say it because I don't want to waste time guessing. So but is that where it, like the other moms like give wine? I it's like guessing. a na- neighbors. <laughs> it's like neighbors' way to recognize neighbors. You might see it as a good thing, like oh my neighbor's so thoughtful. You might see it as a bad thing of like oh my gosh, now I have to go get the other neighbor this thing, and it's like work <laughs> on your plate, right? I feel like the first person to introduce it to the neighborhood depends. Some people are going to be into it. Some people are going to be like oh no, here we go. Uh huh. Um, but I think of those trends like that boo basket thing is here to stay. Could there be a way? for someone or you to like take that monster idea but like okay instead of parents buying it for their own kids um could it be a little smaller and it becomes part of this like whether it's a ghost for like the boo basket or whether it's you know something else like the gift the neighborly gifting community gifting thing because I think when you talk about how you gave it to local restaurants I'm like the giving it to other people kind of chain mail thing seems Mm -hmm. to help with sales so anyways that's my soliloquy of like ideas that I, I had like 12 million ideas when hearing your story. So I don't know I what like, for your, if you wanted to give people advice, like let's say that either you wanted to revive it or you, someone wanted to like take this and turn their thing into what you did. Like what, do you have any advice that comes to mind based on having lived the experience? I mean, I honestly like now my brain is like, hmm. I love the idea of like a pass it forward. Um, like you get the kit but you get two kits. So you make a monster and you give it to someone, but they make a monster and give it to some like, but then how would they get a kit? Never mind. I'm not great at logistics. Just it's I'm the- an idea lady. But you know what I mean? Like, like how could this like keep going? And also maybe it's not like that hard of a kit. Like maybe you could just get maybe it only needs two pieces of felt and something. I don't know. Uh there's kits, there's like, like you could this. you could sell like if, if it was a place locally where people could buy them, Ooh, yeah. then you'd have like a monopoly of like, oh, like you get the, the plush thing here. Like I think in the blue basket. Maybe there's a coupon for a little discount on your next kit to pass it on. Keep the monster chain going. Or even like, even if it was pre-made, you know, it's like, hey, Mm -hmm. like the ghost is from here. Like the personalized ghost. Cause I saw personalized ghosts were doing like really well. And people, you know, they love to put their name on everything, their kids' names. So I just feel like there's something here, but then to your point, it's got to work with the economics of it. It's expensive Mm -hmm. to produce the product. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I just like, I mean, I'm just all about also like the human contact was like what I loved calling the people and, you know, like seeing the business, like going to the business. So like, you know, maybe it's not scalable, but it's very nostalgic, I guess, in terms of like before the like huge social media boom. But yeah. Oh my gosh. You have my wheel spinning now too. I'm like, okay, cool. We're going to hang up from this podcast and I'm going to be like, how can I bring back monsters? <laughs> I just love it. I just love it so much. So that's why when I heard your story and also, um, I think you, your interest in seasonal stuff. Now I'm going to get into this part of the episode here, but Deanna, I found her randomly on a website and she was promoting, I think it's like a free lead magnet for you, but she was promoting her anti-hustle holiday series and it looked like a summit that many of you listening probably have attended where you might learn something but this version of it was like kind of the opposite where it was like oh let's just talk like holiday stuff that is not related to like trying to make money trying to learn a specific tactical skill so I kind of want you to explain a little more like give me an example of some of the sessions I just remember I'm like I've never seen anything like this but this lady she gets she gets the seasonal thing because this is all this is perfect right and we talk a lot about seasonality here on this podcast and and through Gold City Ventures so tell us like what is that anti-hustle thing um so the anti-hustle holiday series just was born out of me starting a business an online business um like my day job my job right now is graphic design and um helping people with content plans and stuff like that. And so I feel like I just had been to those summits and I was just like a little bit overwhelmed with all the lead magnets and all the information and all the things. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love Christmas. What if I did a summit that we don't have to learn anything? Can we just take a break from all the learning and all the like trying new things? And so I messaged about the first season was all other podcast hosts, which again, because I'm strategic, was because the following year, 
I wanted to be on more podcasts. So I was like, let me hit up a bunch of podcast hosts, get that first, like you were saying, like foot in the door, like the um, lender who donated the money, like, let's have a conversation, but let's just talk about the holidays. So I feel like, you know, one person shared that they make real eggnog, which I was like totally fascinated and a little bit grossed out by like real, like I was like, oh my God, she makes it in the summer and it has to like be weird in her fridge for a long time. So that, I mean, like one person shared about her Christmas in London at her grandma's house and how they, they made this cardboard house with cotton balls on the roof and there was little presents inside. And like, we do that in my family now, like people just shared holiday traditions. And I was like, oh my gosh, I think my kids would really like that. So now we made one of those houses and we do that. And somebody else talked about her mom makes cookies from just like cake box mix plus whatever. I can't recall right now, but I have made those for my kids at the holidays and it is really easy. So that episode was just like her talking about her mom making these cakeies. I feel like she called them like cookie, cookie cakes. And it was just super fun. And I just really love the holidays, but it was a private podcast. So not only did I connect with all those podcast hosts at the time I had started my business that year, um, quit teaching and went all in. I think I had like a hundred people on my email list back then. And after the anti-hustle holiday series, the first one, I had like 200 people on my list and I was like, oh my gosh, okay, this is great. This is better than any of the PDFs I already made and tried to like do. And I had like a podcast tour for the next year, you know, like reaching out to them and saying, okay, like, I think it'd be cool to talk about this. Or I had a regular podcast at the time, like now come on my podcast and talk about the thing that they're known for. You know, I mean, obviously we all like to share our expertise, but it was a fun way to meet people without having to like bog down people with more tips and more. So the whole idea was over the holidays, just listen to these episodes, take a break from your business, just have fun. And in the new year, follow these people if you like what they had to say. So. Oh my goodness. I love this. And um, we have this other membership I was telling you beyond where we help Etsy sellers build their business beyond Etsy. And then the first thing they have to do is get an email list as uh, one of the first things. And it can be very challenging getting your first non-customer emails mm -hmm. because you need lead to have a big business. You need leads. And Oh, speaking of this, here's Sasha. She's, she's here. Uh, she's at our next I'm in the middle of a podcast, but Sa it's okay. Sasha is actually the lead of um, Beyond. Oh, so cool. I'm going to be interviewing with her next. She's one of our Etsy coaches and who talks a lot about the value of Summit. So I love your Summit because the idea of it, it's not very different than what's out there. It's just cool. And again, it goes back to create an experience that people will love and then you're going to stand out. Like the Monsters was an experience. This Summit is an experience for people. They're used to like someone throwing a hundred different, oh, how to be a sales machine, all this stuff at them. Hey, I want to listen to someone talk about how their grandmother made Christmas cookies and create a new tradition for the family. Like, perfect. That sounds great. Um, yeah. It's an alternative to reality TV. I was just looking. There's a new Christina Milan holiday special or something. I'm going to watch it. But hey, maybe I'll listen to this too. And it's, you know, can get my mind off stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. And Anyways. I think too, like for businesses, we tend to gravitate towards people we like, right? Especially like in my area, it's podcast host service providers. And like we are not really listening to people that we don't like. Like, you're not going to keep listening to a podcast if you don't like the person. So it was a fun way for the listeners to listen for 10 minutes and be like, oh, this person sounds fun. Let me see what they have to do with business. So it's like flipping the script, like people first, then business instead of oh like gosh. all business. So obsessed. Okay. Well, Deanna, um, we're coming up on time here, but I do want to give you a chance to talk about the Playhouse. So at the conclusion of this episode, thank you for coming. Tell us like, what is your next move here with Playhouse and just tell everyone who might be interested about it. Yeah. I mean, I just created the Playhouse because I've just really been getting into more networking and collaborations. And honestly, like I am so sick of social media. I'm sick of doing everything exactly the same. Like we're saying like the summits, like it just feels like what is next? So like, can we invent a new thing that's going to grow our list? Can we invent a new way to collaborate with people? Um, like I always think like one, once upon a time, a webinar didn't exist. And then somebody like made a web, like invented a webinar. So I really want a space where we can all come together and it's not really like you're not joining like my membership. I'm really passionate that it's like our community, all the people together have a voice in what we're doing and, um, all the different events. And, um, I don't know. I'm just like so excited to see what the new year brings for this really collaborative, fun, experiential place.
for and it's not for Etsy sellers. It's for well, it, it could be for them, but it's also for like freelancers and graphic designers. Yeah. Um, so it's it's going to be a group of people that do different business functions. Yeah. Right. And I mean, I, yes. And I am like, it's funny we talked about the anti hustle holiday series, but I want it to be for the whole person entrepreneur. So there are fat liberation body coaches in there because it's really hard to market your business if diet culture's in your head and you feel like you're too fat to make a reel and everyone's gonna look at you and judge you. Like there's a person who does meditation because like we're all burnt out, you know, someone's going to do like movement um, events where you can remember to like my watch reminds me to stand up some days when I'm hyper-focused on a website or working. <laughs> like I want people, especially if we're all like working by ourselves and a lot of Etsy owners I know are like doing all the things, the bookkeeping, the everything by yourself. It's a great space to get help with the things you're not a genius at. and. Like we just did a season seven love is blind event where we hung out and talked about love is blind, whoever wanted to come. So it's like people and business owners. It doesn't have to be just like one or the other. So, okay. I love it. So I think, you know, people listening, they're going to be people who are going to get you and they're going to check that out because <laughs> they, they're getting it. Um, and I, I love that. So Deanna, thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to link to playhouse below. This has been such a fun episode and I, hopefully Everyone who's listening can just get their wheels turning. If you take away one thing, can you do something with local businesses in your town? And I know even for me, the moms group in my town, they asked me if I'd do an Etsy webinar and I said no. Okay. So I understand it's harder. It's harder than well, when you start getting in your real life, you're like, I don't know if I want to do it. So maybe all of us need to be a little brave together and just be like, Hey, this is who I am. This is what I love. And and we're going to attract people that we didn't even know had similar passions or whatever from it. But yeah. I, I get And if you I say Etsy, that. like you're automatically cool. I think like if you say you're an Etsy owner, I'm going to be like, oh my God, you're awesome. I think people are impressed by that. I'm just saying you're not Etsy oh, weirdo, you're Etsy rock star. I'm so impressed by it myself, but then I get it. Like you want to, your, your community, your kids, the other parents, it's like, it's like a whole thing. So I get it. I, yeah. I, I haven't bridged up myself, but like hearing this story for you, you kind of, you're getting me revved up about it. Is there something that I could be doing or other people could be doing with even just like with local businesses some some type of collaboration a gifting thing yeah. wheels are churning i'm you know i'm sure but anyway stan i'm yes. gonna let you go thank you for having me yes thank this was you. amazing this has been a blast uh thank you